Thank you so much, Caroline, and welcome everyone. I think this session will follow very nicely on the last, and, and I'm really pleased that we're able to have a conversation on, on what I would call enabling conditions for sustainability, governance, inclusiveness, stewardship. Clearly, these have to accompany sound science and ready technologies to make progress quickly and transformatively, not incrementally. Uh, we will try to have each panelist's intervention be a brief two minutes so that we can also get to, send to the questions from the audience. And so I also encourage the audience to use the chat to ask their questions. Uh, so on to the panel, so many credentials and so little time. Uh, first, we have Professor Eduardo Brandizio, who is a distinguished professor of anthropology, and he directs the Center for the Analysis of Social Ecological Landscapes at Indiana University. He's also co-chair of the Global Assessment of Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services uh, and through an intergovernmental body, IPBES. He's really an expert on the value and the use of indigenous knowledge. He studies many things from global to local. For example, the acai berry, which is really dependent on indigenous knowledge and local producers. Eduardo was born in Sao Paulo and has studied some families in Brazil for 30 years, but he also guides these truly global assessments. Then we have Professor Gretchen Daly, who is the Bing Professor of Environmental Science and Director of the Natural Capital Project at Stanford called NatCap. And she's also this year's Tyler Prize winner for Environmental Achievement, along with Partha Dasgupta. But she's also previously won the Volvo and Blue Planet Prizes. Her NatCap team spend years, even decades, working closely with local communities struggling to solve environmental problems. And they seek, her team seek to provide options that are better, greener, cheaper, and smarter. Um, Gretchen's most beloved spot in the world is Costa Rica's Las Cruces Biological Station. We also have the Honorable Jane Lubchenco, the new Deputy Director for Climate and Environment at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy also a distinguished university professor at Oregon State University, also a winner of the Tyler Prize and the Blue Planet Awards, uh, formerly director of NOAA, the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration, and the State Department's first envoy for the ocean. She also founded the Aldo Leopold Program to train scientists to be communicators. Jane grew up in Colorado. She was a competitive diver, um, but when she reached the rocky ocean shoreline of the East and West Coast, she found a whole new reason to explore and dive in. And then we have Honorable Joe Stiglitz, university professor at Columbia and also the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute and co-chair of the OECD expert group on the measure of economic performance and social progress. He won the 2001 Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences, and he served as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the White House and also chief economist at the World Bank. He's authored many bestsellers, and he's helped create a whole new branch of economics, the economics of information. Joe strongly believes that a liberal education is important for all students. And right now he's missing walks in the woods during this pandemic. He was born in Gary, Indiana, and I dare guess that he's likely the only person hailing from there who is also a member of France's Legion of Honor. So let me start with the first round of questions to get out some of the scope of the environmental sustainability issues on the table in these areas of governance and equity. So let me start with you, Joe. You wrote that the only true and sustainable prosperity is shared prosperity. So would you frame the international equity issues posed by the environmental sustainability issues writ large? Well, it has many dimensions. Uh, there are issues of uh, distribution equity within a country, between countries, and across generations. And when you talk about sustainability, 
one's really focusing a lot about across generations. You know, uh, our politicians often talk about the burden of debt that we might leave our children uh, if we uh, uh, borrow too much. But if we, uh, that, that, those br debts, burdens, are dwarfed by, uh, what, by the inequities that would arise if uh, we live the, leave them a devastated planet, a, a planet facing climate change where biodiversity has been uh, 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 destroyed, uh, undermined, uh, where the biosphere has been damaged. So um, that aspect, I think, is absolutely crucial and I'll come back later and talk a little bit about the uh, inequities across countries and within countries. But I wanted to mention uh, in that, this cross-generational equity issue uh, uh, a specific um, uh, battle that I've been involved in, which is a suit by 21 children uh, against the U.S. administration. It's called the children's suit informally where they're saying their future is being undermined by what we're doing today. Um, it's uh, bringing that suit under uh, two uh, bases. One is called the public interest doctrine, which requires the sovereign or state to hold and trust uh, resources for the benefit of all people, including future uh, generation. Um, and, uh, it, it's a very old doctrine that goes back to the Justinian Code. And the other is the due process provisions of the Constitution. S similar suits have been brought in other countries, uh, recognizing the, the responsibility of the government, not only for this generation, but for the future uh, generation. Thank you for that. You know, the youth certainly are activated. Um, at the youth summit at the United Nations, uh, one of the most poignant comments was, we are 25% of the population, but we are 100% of the future. Exactly what you say. <laughs> and, um, you know, even when that lawsuit started that you speak of, um, we didn't even know that we were going to plop on top of that a giant pandemic. And, and Eduardo, in 2019, you warned that rampant deforestation and uncontrolled expansion of ag and mining and infrastructure and exploitation of wild species created a perfect storm for the spillover of disease from wildlife um, to people. Uh, yeah, it was. Um, can you comment on what biospheric stewardship means and how we can tackle these challenges, biodiversity, climate change, inequality, simultaneously. Again, remembering we are thinking uh, about issues beyond science, the enabling conditions. Thank you, Rosina. Um, well, in two minutes, if I have to talk about biosphere stewardship, I would say it's a threefold challenge. It's one of recognition, first of all. I think one of empathy and one of cooperation. And recognition is very much along the lines that you were talking about, you know, and the global assessment shows that very well. Uh, we have reconfigured the biosphere, you know, and became the main force behind many of our system processes, not only the climate, but we look at all virtually all indicators of ecosystem integrity, biodiversity, agrobiodiversity and the contributions that we derive from nature, and they're all under decline. So they pose a different level of challenge for governments. Second point is empathy and equity. You know, those suffering the most have contributed the least. And the benefits and burdens of the development process that we have put forward are very unequally distributed, both within and across countries. And those inequalities are exacerbating and compounding each other exactly for those who are most vulnerable. You know, the people that Karen just mentioned in the previous sections that are fueling cities with precarious urbanization, areas in rural areas that are confronting climate change, you know, and, and, and facing their um, you know, food production and other issues. Indigenous people in local communities who are at the forefront of expanding frontiers in climate change. So that's a second challenge. Biodiversity stewardship 
is the stewardship of inequality as much as of uh, first processes. And third, cooperation. I think as individuals and communities, we have evolved, as Lynn Oster would say, you know, within an inescapable lattice of interdependence of our common pool resources. And we have developed, you know, many ways, in many cases successfully, ways of, you know, dealing with uh, an equal appropriation, free riding, an equal burdens, and obligations to each other, as, as Joseph just said, in terms of future generations. Now, that lattice of interdependence is now global, but our institutions are still working at a single level and sectoral level. So there are many hurdles, I think, for us to think about collective action to arms, uh, Earth stewardship, you know, the scale, the interconnections, uh, the synchronicity, but also the perceptions of injustice, the challenge of misinformation and mistrust. So we, you know, the current challenge that we have have a different order of governance that defy the kinds of governance that we develop at the sector and level specific governance. So I think we need governance that is integrated and multi scalar to deal with policy incoherence informed by legitimate and credible knowledge, you know, cross-sectoral and adaptive to uh, enable learning and inclusive to ensure equity and appropriation. Biosphere stewardship, I think, is an emergent process uh, from these different dimensions. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo. Um, it's, it's clear, though, that many of the biospheric um, services are not valued appropriately at all. And so they don't get counted into what we might call inclusive growth. And Gretchen, you have argued persuasively that we need to move from knowledge to action, especially in this area of valuing ecosystem goods and services. So I'm wondering if you could speak to how can, how can we ramp these efforts up quickly to move towards equity and sustainability at the same time? So much, Rosina, and everyone, can you hear me okay? Fantastic. <clears throat> I really appreciate the chance to participate in all the work that's gone into this tremendous moment. In answer to your question, I'd say there are basically two revolutions underway. The first is at the core of science, developing new approaches to advance engaged science that's developed, co-developed with decision makers and other users, whether in communities and governments, in corporations, in the investment sector, in infrastructure sectors, across NGOs. This science is shining a light on humanity's place in the web of life and all of our interdependence for well-being and development on the nature that we're embedded in. And doing so in a way that is second, this is the second revolution, made accessible and actionable for decision makers. So in shining a light on these values of nature, whether for the material basics of nutrition, physical and mental health, security and water, energy and climate, or even the more intangible senses of belonging, creativity, and other aspects of well-being that come from immersion in a healthy way in healthy ecosystems. This science is being made accessible and actionable thanks to um, a global partnership that, Rosina, you mentioned at the beginning that was really inspired, actually, by work at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences decades ago, led by the Bayer Institute more recently, the Stockholm Resilience Center. And the partnership um, encompasses about 300 both research and practitioner institutions, including the Chinese Academy of Sciences and many others. And together, we've built a global platform with free and open source global data, building on the technology and advances mentioned in the last session um, on in, you know, global environment, social data, and it has software that's now used in over 185 countries to illuminate you know, where and how much to protect in order to achieve both you know, all these goals that we have um, 
environmental and more social, deeply intertwined. Um, how to harmonize conservation and regeneration of ecosystems with improved livelihoods and improved equity and access to nature's benefits. And third, how to track progress. So this is being deployed now um, across the world in examples that I might elaborate on in the next round, um, but in 55 cities across Latin America, major cities across coastlines of Latin America and the Caribbean for climate resilience and through land zoning. In China, for example, 50% of the land is now zoned for ecosystem regeneration and about 200 million people are being paid to achieve that re regeneration. So these revolutions, I think, um, align really well with what was teed up in the various sessions um, here in the Nobel Summit building to now and offer great promise for accelerating the transformation that we all seek. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. You know, very important to get to that point of actually measuring too, because as we're trying to either optimize or maximize across multiple goals, it gets very hard to know if you are succeeding or not. But I think the way you describe, you know, that our changing view of uh, the web of life uh, and its its key support system for for all of human life, it is really um, having a big impact and changing how we think about the natural world. And I, and I wanted to turn to Jane because Jane, you presciently said back in 1997, um, you set the concept out of uh, 20 by 2020, which at that time you meant saving 20% of the ocean by now. <laughs> um, and so I wondered if you could reflect on the historic practices which were really um, to set aside protected areas and how instead that can evolve into practices that preserve biodiversity, help store carbon, but additionally might offer some uh, adaptation measures against future surprises by ensuring ecosystem integrity, adaptation corridors, etc. So thanks for that question, Rosina. Um, and thanks for all the great comments of uh, the uh, other folks on this panel. Um, it, it's absolutely true that protected areas have been used for centuries uh, by people around the world uh, to protect and regenerate nature. Uh, the Polynesian cultures uh, in the Pacific, for example, established tapu areas for that very purpose. Um, fast forward to today, uh, there is, uh, I think, increasing recognition of the importance of protected areas. Uh, countries have made commitments to protect a certain fraction of the ocean by certain dates. Uh, but part of what is playing out is a tension that has unfortunately developed, which uh, focuses attention on protected areas and loses sight of what's happening in the larger areas that are not in the protected areas. And I think there needs to be a dual parallel focus on having effective protected areas because they serve a very important role, but also in those areas outside protected areas, having more sustainable use of those areas. And so it's not a 20% or a 30% or a 50% issue, it's a 100% issue where we need to be managing areas more sustainably outside protected areas while having those protected areas be more effective. So that I think is um, a, a, just a, a slightly different framing today we do need even more protected areas and we need more effective protected areas. About 17% of the land is protected according to United Nations Environmental Program uh, Protected Planet. Uh, and about 8% of the ocean uh, is in any kind of protection. Uh, but the science that has looked at protected areas, I think is teeing up a number of key issues. One of which is that it shouldn't just be about qu 
quantity that is protected, quality matters as well. And what I mean by that is that an area that is only minimally or lightly protected certainly cannot deliver the full range of benefits of an area that is fully protected. And so the level of protection matters. Point number two, so too do the enabling conditions, what the social scientists are calling the enabling conditions under which protected areas are created or managed matters. This needs to be public engagement, uh, areas that are co-created, and we need to pay equal attention to not just the ecological outcomes, but the social outcomes. So that there is uh, recognition from the outset that protected areas bring not only biodiversity benefit, it's not just protecting biodiversity, that in turn brings significant benefit to people through ecosystem services and through the ability of protected areas to be more resilient if they have the full component of biodiversity and to be a key part of adaptation to climate and other environmental changes. The third message that is emerging from the science is that, uh, and, and to the point of your question, uh, there are multiple benefits that can arise from protected areas if, in fact, we have those in mind and pay attention to them and then design protected areas accordingly. And I'm thinking specifically of a paper that was just published in Nature by Enrique Sala and colleagues that provides a new methodology for achieving three simultaneous benefits from, in this case, marine protected areas, but the same thing could be true on land. One is protecting biodiversity for sure, but the second is to protect stores of carbon. As it turns out, the upper meter of the seafloor has twice as much carbon as soils on land. We don't tend to think of the seafloor as an important place for storage of carbon. Much of this is concentrated in the coastal areas because it's been pouring off the land and it just is sitting there. So that carbon is stored. If a fishing vessel trawls that area, it stirs up the sediments, and some of that carbon is released uh, into not only this, the um, water column, but into the atmosphere. And so protecting those star stores of carbon is an important new idea that can now be begun to be included into the nationally determined contributions of countries if they have permanently protected areas. So carbon storage and protecting carbon storage can be a really important function of protected areas if they are designed with that in mind. And then finally, we know that when areas are fully protected, uh, biodiversity uh, flourishes within, uh, areas can recover from being depleted, and much of that bounty spills to adjacent areas outside and can help replenish depleted fisheries. And so this solid all paper provides a new methodology for considering those three benefits simultaneously and says, where should we think about protecting areas if we want those three simultaneous benefits? So a new methodology, new science is informing some new thinking about protected areas that is set in this larger context of needing to manage the land and the ocean more sustainably using protected areas, but paying attention to what happens outside those protected areas as well. Thank you. You know, I think when we think about um, how land-based systems have been included in the climate treaties, it's mainly for their carbon content, not for all the other stuff. And here we're saying there's carbon and there's biodiversity, and we need to get this together. We need to integrate across geography, we need to integrate across issues. We need both quality and quantity. Um, and that the decisions about what should be done absolutely requires the appropriate multi-stakeholder dialogue. So the communities involved are helping to decide the solutions. 
not not just the scientists. Thank you for that. I wanted to move to a, a second round to really talk about scaling. In, in my mind, you know, pilot projects are, are very important, but the whole issue of scaling almost involves like a different theory of change. And, and to paraphrase Carl Foka's paper that we were, uh, we were using all of us as a background for these sessions, um, he said, uh, transformation is creating fundamentally new systems of human and environmental interactions that, as you've all said, nurture resilience, equality, and inclusive growth. Um, so let me come back to you, Eduardo, and ask, um, lots of good things are happening, but, but how can we really scale it up <laughs> transformationally this decade, which, as we know, is a really important decade? Thank you for this question, Jose. I don't think there's a single answer to this question. We need, you know, mutually supportive actions at all levels and time frames. But I like to think about this question uh, in three levels. You know, one is the here and now. So because as you said, and as we are documenting, for instance, in the Amazon, there are hundreds and thousands of initiatives at the, the local level that are making a difference locally, but not always have the enabling condition, you know, to um, to, to scale up. So I think at the personal level, we have, you know, this uh, kind of supporting these initiatives that are out there and making a difference at all levels. At the policy and decision-making level, you know, implementing existing uh, agreements and, and instruments and build upon the instruments that are working, right? So those are things that we can do now to help uh, scale up. And at the sectoral level, you know, I think we have the knowledge to implement management practice in agriculture, fisheries, energy, mining, and forestry to move towards, a, you know, a more landscape perspective. Uh, what Jane was just saying is exactly what is happening in the Amazon. We're, you know, turning an important step towards conservation and indigenous lands that are now becoming islands of conservation uh, and islands of cultural diversity surrounded by agribusiness. That's what I mentioned on the limitations of single level governance. A governance may be working very well within an indigenous area, but being overwhelmed by the changes and pollutions around them. So we need to bridge institutions that allow those processes to happen. I think a second level is a decadal challenge and, you know, where we can implement more structural, regulatory and, and kind of uh, uh, more uh, address societal values and narratives about nature. And I think that starts this year with the post-2020 biodiversity agreement and the new climate summit. I think those are key elements this year to allow creating this enabling environment, you know, that offers a framework for initiatives at all levels to be integrated. You know? So then we, we can move, I think, towards uh, uh, internalizing you know, externalities in supply chains, uh, look at cross-sectoral planning and actions that are mutually synergistic. And I think those two frameworks are really key. And of course, a longer time frame for deeper transformation of our minds and hearts, you know, the narratives that we have and how we incorporate those as social norms. So, there's not a single answer to scaling up, but it's important to look at all those levels and how they complement and enable each other. Well, thank you, Eduardo. So, so you have brought up, you know, two of the possible transformational enabling elements that are still going to happen this year: uh, the Biodiversity Convention and the Framework Convention on Climate Change. So, so Gretchen, with this vision of scaling. What do you see as the capacity for, for nature-based solutions in this year of biology? And uh, when we hope to find some coherence across these two treaties, perhaps using, as Jane said, uh, the, these new techniques uh, to, to try to marry wet and dry and carbon and biodiversity. Um, but I think nature-based solutions are gonna be key as we're hearing. And I also think valuation is going to be key. So. What do you see for these two treaties in the mode of transformational and nature-based solutions? That is a really great question. And um, the answer I think is pretty inspiring, however um, daunting the challenge is. So nature-based solutions, it's an, maybe a bit of an acronym, but it's pretty clear what it means. And it's basically a lens through which to strengthen action for ecosystems. 
That means conservation and regeneration, you know, at scale. And it's a way of number one, focusing and driving action in an integrated way, like you're saying, to simultaneously and efficiently, given how much we already dominate the planet, um, target investments to address these key problems in climate, in biodiversity realms, relating to human health, food systems, livelihoods, resilience, all of it. Biodiversity really at the heart and offering um, pathways to rapid um, drawdown of carbon and rapid improvement in many of these other social challenges. The second is um, nature-based solutions really open non-traditional partnerships, engagements across sectors, and also they open doors to new financing. So I'll give an example. Um, let's look at the country of Belize, one of the most innovative countries in the world. A few years ago, um, they launched an effort to develop a 20-year forward-looking green and inclusive development plan that addresses climate and biodiversity challenges. Um, this involved working across many sectors, offshore oil and gas drilling, commercial shipping, cruise tourism, um, there was commercial and artisanal fishing, infrastructure development, you know, for energy, for transportation, urban expansion, and agriculture and forestry. Um, so all these sectors and the relevant parts of government got together and developed using the natural capital approach and this nature-based solutions lens, a harmonized plan looking out 20 years for inclusive and green development with a lot of investment in conservation and regeneration, particularly of coastal ecosystems. The ones Jane loves most, the mangroves, the seagrass beds, the coral reefs, especially for coastal climate resilience, but for resilience throughout the economy and in delivering human well-being. This approach in terms of opening you know, new financing. It was funded by IDB and it, um, the Inter-American Development Bank through a brand new natural capital lab that they've launched. Um, and I have to say that in terms of scaling, these public facing multilateral development banks are really leading the way. So after the Inter-American Development Bank launched this natural capital lab to support countries in devising these plans and actually funding and implementing them. Um, the Asian development bit in the discussing Asia. Um, so these, oh, sorry, my internet's unstable. I hope you can hear and I'll just finish saying. Yeah. Anyway, now I can't hear you. <laughs> Gretchen, maybe you should just turn off your camera for the second to finish. Um, here's the key frontier, these public facing banks. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, I, my closing point was just to be that these public facing banks, um, especially the multilateral development banks really stand out as leading the innovations here at scale. And we urgently need co-financing from private sector institutions. And um, that is a really key frontier, bringing these approaches, nature-based solutions into private investment at scale and in um, collaboration with governments and with these um, public facing entities. Thank you. Thank you, Gretchen. I'm really glad that you brought up the issue of public-private partnerships. You know, if we look at the, the scale of the problem in the orders of trillions, if not tens of trillions, um, the public money is simply not going to be enough. And so really ramping up public-private partnerships is keys, key. And I, I would agree with you that there's been a real change in um, 
the tack that many of the multilateral environmental banks are taking um, and to uh, welcome things like nature-based solution and net zero carbon. So Joe, I think that comes to you. Again, we're, we're talking about scaling, you know, reaching net zero greenhouse gas emissions and having them in this decade um, requires really bringing that economic community, uh, the private sector and the science community together. I wanted to ask you what additional ways you think that could happen, but I wanna also say and, and ask if you would comment on the fact our current global models don't really model distributional outcomes at a fine grain level. So, you know, again, I'm coming back to the, how will we know we're succeeding given the models, given the models we have, but why don't you speak uh, to how to get to net zero science economics. And if you wish to speak to our global models and distributional equity in your two minutes, that would be great. Yeah, I was gonna say <laughs> all in two minutes, so that's fine. Well, let me first say in terms of scaling up, uh, I think, one has to, uh, uh, one can't rely on the private sector alone. Uh, one has to have a leading role of government here in uh, regulation, in public investment, like in infrastructure, in providing uh, uh, incentives for developing countries to keep their forest, their rainforest, their biodiversity, um, and finally, uh, as an economist, uh, we always talk about the role of prices, the price signals. And one of the uh, first things that the uh, Biden administration did was to issue a, an executive order for a interim uh, social cost of carbon, which is a part of the calculation of how you provide a price uh, on you know, we've been treating something that uh, is very scarce and precious as if it were a free good. Um, and the same thing you can say about biodiversity and lots of other things. But um, what came out was a number that was much too low, uh, much better than the previous administration. So I mean, that, that, that goes without saying, but uh, it was a number around $60. And uh, if you welcome 3.5 degree temperature, centigrade temperature change, that's fine. But most of the scientific community and the international community is talking about one and a half to two degrees. And uh, the number that uh, uh, was used was uh, the kind of number that was generated with models that would have led to uh, this three and a half degrees centigrade. So there are two observations make very briefly on that. And I think this is really important in terms of motivating to scale the changes across our society. Um, the first is um, that they were based on integrated assessment models, which were a major step forward in bringing together economics and the environment, but they didn't do it well. <laughs> they, they didn't use the best science. Uh, they didn't use the best economics. Uh, they didn't take into account market failures. They didn't take account the huge risks which are dominating the public discussions of whether we should accept one and a half to two, to, or two degrees or three and a half degrees. I mean, it's un inconceivable that you would wanna take the risk of three, deg three and a half degrees. And yet these models are blasé about accepting that kind of a, a risk. And good economic models actually do incorporate risk, but unfortunately, these are not the models that were uh, used. The second thing is, it goes back to what I talked about in my first uh, set of comics, not valuing future generations enough. They're using discount rates like 3%. And that means that uh, you you really don't value uh, a dollar in 50 years very much. And a dollar in 100 years, you don't value it uh, uh, hardly at all. And so if you use those kinds of discount rates, which are not based on good economics, you're going to uh, accept uh, a future world that is very impaired, not only in terms of climate change, but in terms of uh, biodiversity. 
Uh, I wanted to give one more uh, example, uh, one other example of of, of uh, um, uh, scaling up, not on quite the grand scale that you need, I think, where you have to have government involved, but a project that came out of a class project, uh, a term paper uh, in one of our my, my, one of my courses. And that is, it, it grew into what is called the Rainforest Coalition, which recognizes that developing country, the rainforest countries are providing valuable global uh, ecosystem services, biodiversity, uh, storage of carbon, and has tried to enlist the countries in a commitment to maintain their rainforest and to enlist uh, some of the richer countries uh, to help uh, enable them to maintain those rainforests. And so uh, it's been engaging with a large number of countries in trying to get them to maintain their rainforest uh, with a broad array of, of um, you might call it natural capital, uh, of, of carbon and biodiversity and uh, try to change the incentives rather than an incentive to destroy the rainforest, have an incentive to preserve them. Thank you. Um, I've just been notified we only have five minutes left, Jane. I was going to ask you um, to compare uh, what we've done with land-based systems and ocean systems, but I think you did a fabulous um, moment on that. So instead, maybe as a closing comment, you get two minutes, everybody else gets less than one because you're finishing the second round. Um, I would like to know if you think because of this unusual moment in time that we're in with COVID and build back better green that that offers, in fact, a, a, a mode of transformational change that maybe was not possible before. So for sure, this is a moment in time. Uh, we dare not squander it. Uh, I'm reminded of Joni Mitchell's comment that you don't know what you've got till it's gone. And we are seeing, uh, through COVID, loss of connection with other people, loss of connection to nature, uh, many of the things. And that is motivation. But I want to fold into that comment, uh, picking up what Joe just focused on with incentives and highlight the importance of using incentives, both economic and uh, social norms, to change behavior in ways that can take advantage of the current situation, but also scale. And in the ocean, for example, these are complex adaptive systems. Uh, we are, you know, it's, it's a, a coupled human nature system, paying attention to the feedbacks between individual actors and the emergent properties of the system and how that in turn affects, uh, feeds back to the individual actors is really important. And we've seen how governments can use uh, changes of incentives for fishermen and women to transform fisheries from increasing overfishing to actually sustainable fisheries using rights-based approaches, secure access approaches has truly been transformative. And that thinking is not just true for economic incentives, but for social norms as well. And so incentives matter and we need to keep that in mind and understand how to use those to get from where we are now to more sustainable practices and policies, building on this opportunity we have today. Thank you, Jane. I think you know it's very clear we need top down and bottom up in order to make transformational change. Um, so, is there a last forty five second <laughs> comment from Eduardo, Gretchen, Joe? Thank. You. Or we, we will be taken off the stage. Thank you. Uh, my, my, my comment was about repurposing perverse subsidies into incentives, but I want to take this few seconds to, to say that we cannot talk about bi biosphere stewardship without recognizing, supporting, and including indigenous people and also local communities as key, key partners in this process. There are half a billion people, indigenous people in the world. They manage 25% of the land surface that's where the most conserved ecosystems are. That's where almost 40% of the protected areas overlap. 
and their contributions to agrobiodiversity, to food production, to managing fisheries, to managing watershed has impact broadly in society. Large invisible, large man marginalized, and they are at the forefront of this economy that is destructive and continue to move in frontiers around the world. So I think we need to bring them front and center uh, to this conversation. Thank you. Gretchen, a last comment? Oh, we're not hearing you if you do. Oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, <clears throat> the one point I'd like to drive home is an inspiring one, which is um, that the UN just a month ago approved the UN Statistical Commission gross ecosystem product as a metric for global use. And this metric enables the measuring, reporting, and managing of natural capital for which we need global standards connected like everybody's saying to policy incentives and other mechanisms at all scales to drive investments in nature. It's a gross ecosystem product. Um, it's parallel to GD, uh, sort of GDP and its construction and just looks at all the ecosystem goods and services and their value produced in a place over a year. And it's now being deployed widely in an experimental phase, but um, really scaling up in China and now starting to be deployed in other countries. Colombia is the first. And they're again supported by the multilateral development banks with other countries raising their hand across Asia and elsewhere and in line for support in building the capacity to measure, report, and manage, invest in, and regenerate natural capital. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gretchen. Good news. And Joe, do you have a soundbite for us? <laughs> uh, just a couple of uh, quick soundbites. First, uh, I want to uh, second what Jane said about the importance of incentives. But for incentives to work, there has to be uh, good information. And what we just heard is about uh, 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 good information systems. But at the private sector level, we have to require more disclosure about what they're doing. And including, you know, so, so moves by the SEC, by the Federal Reserve, to require more disclosure, I view, is absolutely essential. I also want to uh, just second what Jane said when you're talking about incentives, uh, to include social norms. And Eleanor Ostrom, who taught at IU uh, I, and was uh, uh, the first woman uh, uh, economics Nobel Prize winner, uh, often emphasized the importance of uh, these norms and, and uh, a broader sense of incentives. The second point I want to raise very briefly is um, COVID-19 has raised uh, real questions about the nature of intellectual property. Uh, it's a social construction which is important as part of an incentive system, but can impede innovation and can really impede uh, social progress. Uh, and we've seen how uh, the uh, refusal of, of the United States and some other countries to support the waiver at the WTO of the intellectual property related to COVID-19 is causing tens of thousands of deaths um, the, the fact is that there is also a similar concern of intellectual property related to uh, climate change uh, and that uh, it is one of the factors that has uh, caused problems in many developing countries. It was recognized in the Rio, um, but has uh, fallen by the wayside. And the third thing uh, we've seen again from COVID-19 very great concern about the K-shaped recovery, the inequalities, and uh, that is true about all the issues that we're talking about today, and uh, they have to be put front and center. Thank you. Um, so we are about to have the proverbial trap door opened on stage to get us all off. Uh, Jane, did you have a last soundbite in addition to dive in, which was the way you ended yesterday? Let's do it. Okay, let's do it. So I want to thank everyone. Isn't it great to have these great scientists who are also civic scientists working to advance equity and stewardship 
as well as science. So thank you to all of you. We clearly could have gone six more hours, but very happy to turn it back over to you, Caroline, and very proud of this panel. Thank you all.